Hi folks and welcome to episode 2 of Critical Race Theory Explained. This one is going to be about the epistemology of the oppressed. How critical race theory finds itself grounding itself in the black community in the United States. We are, through the course of these videos, going through Kimberly Crenshaw's epic book, Critical Race Theory, The Key Writings That Form the Movement. This is edited together by her, featuring numerous essays, including her own, uh, explaining the genesis, uh, the formulation, and the future of critical race theory as laid out by themselves. These are This is an academic coursework book, and that's why I read it, made loads of notes about it, and we're going through each essay individually. Uh, so in the previous video, we covered the genesis of critical legal studies, which came from the neo-Marxist rejection of the liberal solution to the problem of civil rights and desegregation in part one. And so we've moved on to part two of this book, which is Critical Race Theory and Critical Legal Studies, Contestation and Coalition. And this describes how uh, the critical race theorists call themselves race crits, uh, how they divorce themselves from the critical legal scholars uh, by adopting their critique of legal rights on the grounds that they are necessarily indeterminate and contradictory. So the essay we're going to be looking at today is the fifth one, which is called Looking to the Bottom, Critical Legal Studies and Reparations by Mari Matsuda. And she has raised the central problem of her essay, and she says this, quote, The central problem facing critical legal scholars, and indeed all, th uh, all thoughtful legal scholars, is the search for a normative source. Arthur Leff, in an oft-cited article, asked, who among us ought to be able to declare law that ought to be obeyed? And she comes to the conclusion that there is, quote, no external universally accepted normative source which exists to resolve conflicts of value. So this leaves critical legal scholars open to, well, anything. As she says, they, quote, disparage traditional sources of norms, such as the market system, the pluralist tradition, and classical liberalism. Yet they hesitate to proclaim new sources of norms. This is where the critical legal scholars were left in a position of con constant deconstruction from the position of those people who became the critical race theorists. Uh, and this is frankly one of the failures of the critical legal scholars, uh, critical legal studies uh, movement as far as the race crits are concerned. And so the question that Matsuda is answering here, really, is what will be the source of the epistemology of critical race theory, and how will they use that to formulate their moral demands? How is this movement going to gather knowledge, is what she's really driving at here. And Matsuda believes that the CRT scholars and CLS scholars are incapable of actually gathering the knowledge required due to their privileged position as people who are doing very well in society, being professional academics, and she combines this with a fetishization of what she calls life on the bottom. She says, The imagination of the academic philosopher cannot recreate the experience of life on the bottom. Instead, we must look towards what Gramsci, Gramsci called organic intellectuals, grassroots philosophers who are uniquely able to relate theory to the concrete experience of oppression. Matsuda, of course, thinks there is a f only one sensible answer to the question of the origin of these norms. She says, quote, This article suggests that those who have experienced discrimination speak with a special voice to which we should listen. Looking to the bottom, adopting the perspective, looking to the bottom, which means adopting the perspective of those who have seen and felt the falsity of the liberal promise, can assist critical scholars in the task of fathoming the phenomenology of law and defining the elements of justice. This is remarkable philosophical framing. People who have experienced discrimination have a special voice and we should listen to it, in her opinion. She believes that examining things from the perspective of the oppressed will somehow give us an insight into the metaphysical structures of the law. And uh, the, the reason for all of this is as quote, when notions of right and wrong, justice and injustice are examined not from an abstract position, but from the position of groups who have suffered through history, moral relativism recedes and identifiable normative priorities emerge. That's remarkable because it's hard to think of a group of people who haven't at some point suffered in history. So this could be any group, anywhere, at any time. But more importantly, she seems to have failed to understand what moral relativism actually is, and seems to be directly expressing a moral relativist sentiment uh, 
in this formulation. As the Internet Encyclopedia of Philosophy of the University of Tennessee succinctly puts it, quote, Moral relativism is the view that moral judgments are only true or false, relative only to some particular standpoint, for instance that of a culture or a historical period, and that no standpoint is uniquely privileged above all others. So Matsuda's formulation here is exactly a description of what moral relativism is. In fact, all she has done is decided to accept moral relativism as correct and ground her relative position in the moral preference of the black community of the United States. I mean, critical race theory as a project is grounded on the presupposition of moral relativism anyway. Uh, the universal ethics of the Enlightenment are, in the critical race theory view, particular to Europeans, what they would call white people and do not encompass all rational beings, as Kant's formulation would hold. Now, I don't think that Enlightenment ethics are even universal to white people, let alone uh, all white people, and moving on. But anyway, it isn't that moral relativism recedes, it is simply that she has chosen her tribe, and their moral structures will flow from their direct interests. And I'm not even saying that she shouldn't do this either, but she must understand that this opens the door for others to simply choose a different community from which to ground their own relativistic position and move outwards from it. There is nothing compelling as to why we should choose this community over others outside of our own personal preferences. Her personal preferences are for a Marxist view of the world, and so she's choosing a particular community that she feels is not invested in the status quo, but I'm getting a bit ahead of myself, so we'll come back to that in a minute. So she says that the experience of being black should be the epistemological source for critical race theory scholars, as in the view from the bottom gives black people a privileged understanding of the world, and this should inform how we know what we know. It is therefore from the perspective of the oppressed that critical race theory should derive its normal normative priorities. As she says, quote, This article then suggests a new epistemological source for critical scholars, the actual experience, history, culture, and intellectual tradition of the people of colour in America. She develops this through the concept of a double consciousness of black people that comes from W.E. Dubois. This includes uh, the mainstream American consciousness of the insider, as in what it's like to be an American, but also the black consciousness of the outsider, what it's not like to be an American. And she says, these two viewpoints can combine powerfully to create a radical constitutionalism that is true to the radical roots of this country. Note, note what she's saying there. Radical constitutionalism in a country that has a settled and codified constitution means the overthrow of that settled and codified constitution. Radical change is root and branch change. It is not incremental change. She uses the example of poetry of black women as a means of co-opting and transforming the system, but it's not terribly interesting. But her main critique of the rule of law f lies in the following contradiction. She says, one, I have a right to participate equally in society with any person. Two, rights are whatever people in power say they are. Now, I don't agree with these formulations, and I don't agree that there's necessarily uh, an irresolvable contradiction here. I mean, the right to participate equally in society with any other person? What does that mean? Like, that could literally mean that I have an equal right to Buckingham Palace as the Queen does, and I don't really think I have that right, uh, but then I'm not a communist. But anyway, this is the continental conception of rights in Enlightenment thinking. In the English conception of rights, rights are imbued in us by God, not constructed by the state, as in rights are not whatever people in power say they are. This, however, of course, creates an external objective source of normative values that Matsuda has already rejected earlier in this paper. But the English tradition is called negative rights, as in the right not to be actively interfered with by an in individual or institution, something external. And from this we derive rights of freedom, as in free speech, free action, free association, etc. Uh, whereas the continental tradition incorporates positive rights, which means access to something, uh, a service, a good, such as housing or food or water or whatever it is. Uh, and so she wants to push for a rule of law which is determinate and committed to the end of oppression. Now this can't be colorblindness, in her opinion, which she considers to be utopian, but then all critical race theorists consider that to be utopian. Uh, and she critiques the US for the internment of Japanese Americans during World War II and a general history of racism in the United States. 
And since Matsuda has adopted the relative moral position of the black community in America, she takes on their moral claims, such as arguments for reparations. She attacks the arguments against reparations in the following ways. Number one, she says, attacking the way we identify victims and perpetrators. That is, reparations identifies new connections between victims and perpetrators, which are generationally. White people benefit from white privilege, which is the accrued power and wealth of oppression. Now, this is very interesting and in many ways, deeply conservative. This is actually very much invoking Burke, even though I don't think that she knows that and she never makes any reference to him at all. But it opens the door to his sort of great chain of civilization mentality uh, that groups of people over time can inherit mon moral benefits or debts. And does she want to go down that road? Given crime statistics, uh, this is a surprisingly conservative position, as I said, but I won't explore it here. But as I said, I don't think the race crits fully understand the implications of what the door she's walked through here. Anyway, number two is linking between an act and a present claim. Reparations claims are based on continuing stigma and economic harm. Now, that may have been true when this was written, but I certainly don't think that's true now. But uh, this is interesting, though, because she claims that uh, reparations satisfy the goal of, quote, retribution. Is that what justice is about? Retribution? As it would be an act of, quote, contrition and humility, which can ease the victim's bitterness and alienation. So what she's saying here is that the white community needs to express contrition and humility before the black community in order for them to feel American. When asked for what the outer limit to this will be, you've got to identify some limits, she says the ability to still identify a victim class that continues to suffer. And what I found really interesting about this is she specifically excludes the victims of the Norman Conquest because she believes that the victims no longer constitute an identifiable and disadvantaged class. Maybe she should have spoken to someone from England about whether they identify themselves as Anglo-Saxons and whether they identify the monarchy as being Norman and the aristocracy as being Norman. Because if you actually look back through their genealogy, it's very easy to identify the, the dukes and barons of this country as being Norman and of Norman heritage. Uh, she has made an assumption there that I don't think holds true, but we'll talk about that another time. Number three is relief. Oppressed group members should identify those entitled to relief must be informed by the non-white experience, as in the oppressed now get to be judges in their own cause. Uh, this is the antithesis of English legal principles of justice, and I reject it out of hand. I don't think that the oppressed should be judges in their own cause. And number four is reparations as transformed liberalism. Radical lawyers seek to transform and uh, hope to transform standard constitutionalism into something mainstream attorneys can exploit. As in, this is an attack on the liberal principles that underpin American society wearing the skin suit of liberalism. This is not a liberal thing to do, but she is hoping that she can sneak it in so, as she says, radical attorneys can exploit it. Matsuda then creates a new interpretation of the Constitution for those on the bottom, in which the promise of liberty means, and I quote, freedom from public and private racism, freedom from inequalities of wealth distribution, and freedom from domination by dynasties. This interpretation obviously supports a doctrine of reparations, whereas traditional constitutionalism does not. But let's explore this framing, because this is fascinating framing to me. Freedom from public and private racism. How can one be free of the opinions of others? Anti-discrimination law in America is already the law of the land, and so public racism is resolved to at least a reasonable and satisfactory level. I think most people would agree. They shouldn't be allowed to create laws that specifically target groups of people because of their race, which is something that I think everyone agrees to, apart from critical race theorists, of course. Uh, however, private racism, what can be done about that? How is that the government's business? If anything, the Constitution of the United States actually does guarantee a person's right to their own opinions, racist or not. That's not something that can be dealt with by the government and the Constitution as it stands now. But of course, if you're creating a radical constitutionalism, this may be something that changes. 
So the next is freedom from inequalities of wealth distribution. And here we have a prime example of the Marxism underpinning critical race theory. Freedom from inequalities of wealth distribution isn't something that one can be free from, because there is no overriding authority imposing inequality of wealth distribution. In fact, inequality of wealth distribution is the consequence of freedom. Equality of wealth distribution would require an artificial power enforcing and imposing behavior on people. Robert Nozick is a really great source on this. He's got a very compelling argument as to why any amount of free action, essentially what he calls any capitalist act, destroys equality. And he's, of course, correct. If we are free to spend our money in ways that we choose, then inequalities are a natural and inevitable consequence of that. And so you would have to basically impose a communist order in order to prevent that. And so in her framing, Matsuda, what she's doing here is concealing reality in order to change the way that we think about it. She is overlaying her own rhetorical hyper-reality on what it is to be free. She thinks that critical race theorists should adopt this new interpretation because it has, quote, transformative power and avoids the traps of individualism, neutrality and indeterminacy, which plague many mainstream concepts of rights or legal principles, and because it, quote, supports group rights rather than individual rights. It's also not a true account of the world and upends the notions of justice that underpin the common law. In the common law view, of course, justice is individual and no man should be judge in his own case. So it is, I mean, it is as radical as it could get. It is the antithesis of the English common law system that America has inherited. And so where it could be objected that this promotes the idea that all wounds can be salved by money. She dismisses it by, even though she admits that that's true, it kind of is saying that. But uh, she does say, well, no son can make up for the loss of freedom or sovereignty. Then why should we use it? If money can't, sol can't resolve this and heal these wounds, why are you focused on money? She also adds that reparations have to be more than simply monetary rewards, and that this may enable, uh, because if we don't have a radical restructuring of all of society, it may enable another victim group to slip to the bottom of society. Some kind of restructuring is required, and when she says this, she's definitely downplaying how radical a restructuring she is actually asking for. But naturally, the communist radical wants radical change to the liberal order. And she's doing this subversively by wearing the liberal mask and saying, listen, what I'm presenting here is really just an extension of liberalism itself, which it's not. It's in fact the complete opposite of what the liberal order of the United States is, which is why it doesn't currently support reparations. But, uh, but of course, the critical race theorists think they can achieve this vision by grounding its normative ethics and epistemology in the communities in America that they believe are not invested in the status quo. And so that's why through looking from the lens of the black community, the critical race theorists believe they can begin to introduce a communistic order in the United States. And Matsuda is pretty open about this. She's not mincing her words. She's not correct in many of her philosophical formulations, but that's only because I'm not a communist, she would argue. And if you're not a communist, well, you'd have no particular reason to agree with any of this.